Hey Bio30s, we're going to be starting a brand new unit today on cellular division and we're going to start off the unit by discussing the divisions, I guess, of genetic material, uh, specifically DNA, uh, before we discuss the actual processes of cell division itself. And I guess the first thing we might want to discuss today, or what I'm going to discuss today, is, is why do cells need to divide at all? Why can't a cell just get bigger and bigger and bigger and why can't cells, why does cells have to be microscopic? Now, We've discussed large cells in the past. We've talked about muscle cells that are essentially the length of a muscle in your body. So like I could have a muscle cell that's like literally the length of my of my bicep in my arm. Uh, we've talked about neurons like um, sensory neurons and motor neurons that are essentially the length of an arm or a leg. Uh, but they're all very small, narrow. They're, they're microscopic. Uh, they're, they're almost like little tubes. And really what it boils down to is the ratio between the volume inside the cell and the surface area of the cell membrane that is surrounding it. If you took a cell and if you look at a normal cell, you could all argue it's like sort of like a sphere. As the cell gets larger, the, the volume of the cytoplasm increases faster than the actual surface area around the actual sphere. So what eventually happens is you get to a point where the, the cell membrane on the outside of the cell isn't there isn't enough area there to sufficiently keep the volume of cytoplasm inside the cell alive. So what a cell does to prevent that from eventually happening is it just a large cell will divide into two smaller cells and then those cells will then grow and then divide on their own. But that's the reason why cells can't simply keep getting bigger. And cell division was sort of a mystery for a long time. In fact, people believed for a long time that cells could just spontaneously appear out of nothing. It wasn't until the late 19th century that a scientist by the name of Rudolf Virchow came along and basically said, no, cells have to arise from other cells. They don't just magically appear out of nowhere, out of thin air. So that was sort of a, I mean, for us, it sounds weird that people would have even have thought that, but back in the day, that was sort of a, 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 like a cataclysmic shift in the way biologists thought about how cells arose. They, they had to arise from another cell. And they didn't understand how that happened but they understood that it, that was the way that it, it had to happen based on the information that Virchow presented. Um, eventually, another gentleman by the name of Fleming came along, and he was the first guy to basically, I guess, identify the nucleus of a cell. He didn't identify the genetic material that was inside the nucleus, but he did you know, realize that there was a part of the cell that was different than the rest of the cytoplasm around it. And he was actually the first guy under a microscope to actually see the process of cell division happen. He didn't understand what was going on. He just was able to document that as cell division occurred, there were certain kind of kind of visual patterns that he could see in the cells that were indicating that this cell division was occurring. And that's what we'll be discussing later in the unit when we get to uh, the topics of mitosis uh, and meiosis. So that's a little bit of the history behind uh, kind of how we came to know about cell division in the first place. Um, but what really plays the biggest role in cell division is the genetic material that's inside the nucleus, which, again, I mentioned Fleming had not discovered, but we now know that it's that genetic material, specifically DNA, which, is, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, which is inside the nucleus, and it's basically calling the shots when a, a cell divides. Um, and basically, it, it allows the cell to divide. It allows the cell to produce, as we're going to discuss later this semester, we're going to be discussing how DNA uh, allows the body to produce all the proteins that we need. And it also uh, provides a way for uh, traits uh, in an organism to be passed down to the next generation. And we'll be discussing that as well later in the, the semester as well when we get to classical genetics. But DNA plays a lot of roles. But essentially, DNA needs to basically duplicate itself before the cell can actually duplicate itself. So the DNA kind of takes the lead and begins duplication before the cell does. And then at that point, the genetic material gets divided amongst the two uh, cells, or if it's meiosis, the four cells that form uh, in, 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 at the end of the division. So, um, so, and if you may want to just really quickly take a look at this video right now up here, it's going to discuss sort of the role that DNA plays. It talks more about the protein synthesis aspect of DNA, but it does give you an idea as to what DNA kind of does, uh, allows you to build the quote-unquote the blueprint of the animal. So you may want to take a quick peek at that video uh, right now. Um, DNA itself is, there's lots of versions of DNA, and when most people think of DNA, they think of chromosomes, and that's sort of the term that most people think of when they think of 
DNA that we have chromosomes in, in, our, in our cells. Well, we do, but only at certain points of a cell's life cycle will there be chromosomes. For the majority of the life cycle of the cell, there are no chromosomes in the cell. There is genetic material, there is DNA, but we don't call them chromosomes. For the majority of the life of a cell, uh, DNA is like in the nucleus, very much like spaghetti. It's like unraveled, it's very thin, uh, long strands of DNA that are in there. And in a human, there'd be 46 strands of this DNA inside of every cell in the body, provided they're not a, a gamete. A gamete would only have 23, which we'll be getting to a little bit later today. But for the majority of the cell, uh, the life cycle of the cell, DNA, we're going to refer to it as chromatin. That's the, the, the terminology that's used to describe um, uh, a cell when it's just sort of going through its day-to-day -day life and it's not really ready to divide or doing any kind of that mitosis or meiosis thing. And we'll get to that again later in the unit. But because the DNA is so long, uh, we have to be able to manage it. Like just like spaghetti on a plate. If you have spaghetti on a plate, you have to be able to manage it. Well, that's where forks come in when you're dying and eating spaghetti. You're going to take that spaghetti and you're going to wrap it up on a fork. Well, there are little forks, I guess, for lack of a better term. They're actually little balls, but they're little protein balls that are inside the nucleus. They're called histones. And the DNA, the chromatin, actually wraps around these, um, these histones to actually uh, make themselves more manageable. So they kind of wrap themselves around these balls, very much like a garden hose would be wrapped around a, uh, uh, you know, like your you know, the thing on the side of your house there where you actually wrap your garden hose up. This is so you're not like letting your garden hose uh, kind of uh, just sit across your lawn all summer long. You can kind of wrap it up and make it more manageable. And DNA does very much uh, the same thing. Um, when a cell gets ready to divide, just before cell division, the, the DNA has to undergo duplication, uh, which we'll be discussing later in this unit. But just before the duplication occurs, the the, the genetic material will condense. The the um, the genetic uh, the, the 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 spaghetti like structures, these chromatin structures, begin to kind of condense in on themselves, uh, with no help from the histones. They sort of do this on their own, and they kind of get into this condensed form, and that's what we actually call a a chromosome. Now you can see this little drawing I've drawn here with the little squiggly lines that are really tight. Normally, when we're drawing a chromosome on diagrams, we just draw them as like these little kind of little, these little sausage-like structures to indicate that that's a chromosome. But these chromosomes only appear just before cell division and during cell division. Once the cell division is over, we go back to our chromatin. Now, after the, the chromatin condenses into chromosomes, the chromosomes then have to duplicate themselves because, again, we have to have double the amount of genetic material before the cell division, so that way after the cell division occurs, the genetic material can equally split between the two cells. If I have, let's say, in a human, 46 chromosomes to start with in a parent cell, if I'm going to do a mitotic division of that cell, each daughter cell has to have 46 chromosomes. So that means that I actually need 92 pieces of genetic information that I'm going to split evenly between these two daughter cells. And when that happens, we don't call them chromosomes anymore. Again, there's another name for them. At that point, we have these joined chromosomes that are attached together with a structure called the centromere, but we don't call them chromosomes when they're attached. When they're attached, we have what are called two sister chromatids. So when the, the chromosome has duplicated, we refer to them as a chromatid. And again, as long as they're attached, they are in that chromatid state. But they're sister chromatids because what we're looking at here is essentially one um, piece of genetic material that has been duplicated. It's actually... It's, it's a copy of itself that's attached to itself, and then eventually these are going to separate uh, during cell division. This is not the same, okay? This is not in any way, shape, or form the same as a chromosome, okay? Online, you're going to see diagrams that look very much like this one. When you Google chromosomes online, you're going to see this X-like structure right here. This right here, this is two chromatids. This would be the original chromosome that's being duplicated off of those those chromatids. So please don't be fooled. If you ever see an X-like structure that's actually joined together with that centromere, those are not chromosomes. Those are technically chromatids before they separate during cell division. So don't get confused between this and another kind of configuration that you might see in your diagrams, which I'll be discussing a little bit later today as well, when you have a pair of homologous chromosomes. So for example, in humans, we have 46 chromosomes that are arranged into pairs. So if I had a pair of chromosomes, this is chromosome 15, these are each one of the pair of that chromosomes. They're not attached, 
They are slightly different chromosomes. They have all the same genetic material on them. And you'll notice that they have little, little areas on the chromosomes that are referred to as genes. Genes are just small sections of DNA on the chromosome that are basically coding for a specific trait, or they could be coding to make a specific protein. But the genes are going to be the same on both of these. They might be slightly different, though, because, you know, you could have two different copies of a gene. If you see two different copies of a gene, or you might have three copies of a gene or four copies of a gene, that's referred to as, uh, as uh, they're referred to as alleles. They're referred to as an allele. So, for example, if I have uh, uh, an allele for, uh, like right now, I don't have hitchhiker's thumb. My, my thumb does not bend back. A lot of you, you check right now, a lot of your thumbs can bend back further than mine. This is a recessive trait. I have two recessive alleles to cause this trait to happen in my thumb. So I've got two copies of the same allele. They're both recessive. Now, some of you have hitchhiker's thumb, which might mean you have two copies of the dominant gene, or you might have one copy of the dominant gene and one copy of the recessive gene. Well, that means that if you have one of each, you've got two different alleles of that gene present in your DNA. Uh, I have two I have two genes that are the same on that on each of those chromosomes, so I've only got one copy of the allele. I've got two copies of the same allele, so that's what an allele is. Um, the location of the gene on the chromosome is known as a locus. If we're referring to more than one locus, we call them loci or loci, loci. Maybe I don't know if you want to maybe remember that from uh, the Marvel movies, but uh, locus is a single location of a gene. If I have several genes that I've got locations for on a chromosome, we're going to refer to those as loci, so that'd be L-O-C-I. Right now, what you might want to quickly do is you might want to quickly just take a look at this video here. This video, if I kind of mangle that, I might have, I don't know, but if I mangle that, quickly take a look at the video right up here right now. That's going to tell you the difference between DNA genes and chromosomes. Hopefully that'll sort things out for you, uh, hopefully a little more clearly. Now I did mention that there are some genes that have uh, different versions. Uh, a really good example of that, and you can see it up here on the slide right here, and this is a good slide to maybe take a peek at in your notes, uh, it talks about blood typing. We talked about blood typing last year in Bio 20. You've got A blood, B blood, AB blood, O blood, and those different blood types are, are basically controlled by three different alleles. There's an allele that has, uh, there's an allele for the A type of blood. There's an allele for the B type of blood. Uh, there would be an allele that would be neither A or B. So, for example, if I had um, uh, two copies of the allele that doesn't give me A or B, that's going to give me O blood. If I've got one A with another A, I would have A blood. If I have uh, A with the no A or B allele, little I as we call it, uh, that would give me A blood. Um, I would be heterozygous, which we'll be getting to uh, later in the course. Um, and if I had one copy of the A and one copy of the B allele, uh, they are actually co-dominant to one another, so I would actually wind up then with AB blood. So the combinations of the alleles on that chromosome, and it's on chromosome just, you know, chromosome number nine that determines your blood type, is going to determine whether you're A, B, A, B, or O. Just to clarify, if you're a negative or positive blood type, that's controlled by a different gene on a different, on a, on a different uh, chromosome. That chromosome is found, uh, it's on chromosome number one. Chromosome number one controls whether you're positive or a negative blood type, and that's simply a dominant and recessive scenario. If I've got two copies of the recessive allele, I'm going to be negative. If I have two copies of the positive allele, I'm going to be positive. If I have a copy of the positive and the negative allele, I'm going to be positive as well because the positive allele is dominant to the recessive allele. Uh, one last thing about DNA. Uh, DNA actually have little aglets on them. So right here on the end of my chromosome right there, I'm going to circle that right there. There's a structure on every chromosome that's known as a telomer. And a telomer works very much like an aglet of your shoelace, which is the, the very end of your shoelace, that little plastic coating, and that prevents your shoelace from unfraying. Well, telomers work the same way. They prevent genetic material from unfraying as well. And there is a lot of studies that have been shown that the shorter the telomers on your chromosomes, the more you're aging. So every time a cell divides, the telomers on the chromosomes get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually when the telomers get too short, 
the cell will no longer be able to divide. So there is a real link right now in science, and they're just, they're looking into this that the, the the length of the telomeres on our DNA actually do control the aging process. So if somehow we could, you know, somehow stop that or uh, reduce the amount of the shortage of the telomeres on the DNA after the cell divisions, that could be used potentially in the future to maybe come up with uh, scenarios that might allow humans to live longer lives. And again, there's a lot of research that has to go into that, but that's what a, that's what a telomer, that's what a telomer actually is. All right. Let's take a look at this bad boy up here. Here's another wonderful diagram and I didn't draw it very well, but you know, you know me, I don't draw very well to begin with, but what we're looking at here is called the karyotype. And right here on your screen, you can see there's a karyotype right there. That is actually a very bad karyotype on that slide because that karyotype is not showing you chromosomes. That karyotype is actually showing you duplicated sister chromatids. So this is a, a bad diagram, another bad diagram on the internet of a, a karyotype. The, the diagrams on the next two slides are gonna give you much better examples of what a karyotype should look like. But I guess, first of all, what is a karyotype? A karyotype allows you to see the, all the, the genetic material in a human. And as I've mentioned a couple of times already, humans have 46 chromosomes. They're arranged into 23 pairs. Now, 22 of the pairs, which are highlighted and are drawn in black here, those are going to be your homologous or chromosomes or your autosomes. These are the ones that are basically, they, you can tell that each chromosome, they are similar in size. They are similar in the distribution of their genes. The loci of each of the genes is, is comparable on, the, on, these, on these homologous chromosomes. So I know that these are pairs, these, these are paired here. Three could not pair with four because I've got I've got four genes here. I've only got two genes on, on chromosome number four, at least in the diagram that I've drawn. So these are basically the 22 chromosomes that are, are kind of, quote unquote, very similar, if not identical. They're probably not going to be identical, but very close because they're more likely going to have, uh, they're going to have the same genes in the same locations, but the versions of the genes might be different. So they might have, you know, this one could be for, let's say, blood type. And I think we said it was on the A, on the chromosome number nine. This could be uh, the A uh, allele. That could be the B allele. So that per person might be A, B blood type in that case. So um, a karyotype just allows me to see the entire genome or the entire genetic makeup of an individual uh, uh, sort of under the microscope, a a a a as it were. Um, there is uh, 22 chromosomes that are homologous to one another. And then you have the last pair of chromosomes, which is chromosome pair 23, which are known as the sex chromosomes. And these are either going to be XX in, in females, or it's going to be XY in a male. Now, you can see why these are, if you're a female, technically the 23rd chromosome is a homologous pair because they are matching chromosomes to one another. So they look like all the other 22 chromosomes. But if you're a male... That isn't the case because the Y chromosome is much shorter than the X chromosome. So they're not a matching pair. There are genes or alleles on the X chromosome that may not be present on the Y chromosome because there simply isn't a chromosome up there for those, uh, you know, those genes to be present. So in a male, for example, you might only need one gene to pass down a trait. For example, male pattern baldness, like Mr. B here. Uh, that's because that gene that controls baldness is actually on the X chromosome. So men are much more susceptible to becoming bald than women because we only need one copy of the gene because that gene would be somewhere up on this part of the X chromosome. I don't need it because there's, there, there is no other gene on my Y chromosome. So that's why men are way more susceptible to, to male pattern baldness uh, than females. So here's that, here's that karyotype I talked to you about here. Here's a karyotype of a woman. You can see the, uh, in, in the circled red there, you can see the, uh, the, the sex chromosomes that are, that are indicated as, as chromosome 23 or chromosome pair 23. And then here is the, the male version. Again, the male sex chromosomes are, are circled. You can see the difference between the two uh, karyotypes. And that's why the sex chromosome is not considered to be homologous, uh, mainly because men have the X Y chromosome, and they're also considered to be sex chromosomes because obviously they determine the sex of the of the individual. If you have XX, you're a female. If you have XY, you're a male. That's that's determined at conception uh, when the uh, the uh, the sperm and the egg basically uh, you know fertilize the, the the zygote, and then that is determined right off the bat uh, as to whether you have an X X X sorry an XX configuration or an XY configuration. 
All right. Okay, and we're almost there, folks. We're, we're almost there. Uh, last topic I want to discuss right now is a couple of terms called diploid and haploid. Diploid and haploid are terms we're going to be using a lot this semester, and they refer to the configuration of chromosomes in the actual organism. So in humans, for example, I've been mentioning this several times today, humans have in their body cells, so this could be like in a heart cell, in a stomach cell, a skin cell, a brain cell, a muscle cell, pretty much any cell that isn't a sex cell, a gamete, uh, either a sperm or an egg, depending if you're male or female, all those cells in the body have basically 46 chromosomes that are arranged into 23 pairs. We just saw them on that previous slide, or up on the slide, or up on the board here. Uh, they're arranged into 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes and the one pair of sex chromosomes, so 22 homologous chromosome pairs and the pair of sex chromosomes. But there's a total of 46 arranged into 23 pairs. For that reason, because they're in pairs, we're going to call them diploid. We're going to call those cells diploid. And that is the configuration of pretty much every cell in your body. And when we do mitotic division, mitosis, these cells are going to divide mitotically. They're going to divide. They're going to start off with a cell that has 46 chromosomes. They're going to wind up at the end with a cell that has 46 chromosomes. On the other hand, you've got the, the oddball cells that basically pass down genetic information for us from generation to generation. Those are your gametes, your sex cells, sperm, egg, right? They're not going to be a diploid configuration. Because imagine if you had a sperm and an egg that both had 46 chromosomes. If they fused together and created a gamete, or sorry, a, a zygote, they're going to have a 92 chromosome zygote. That's going to be double the amount of chromosomes that we would normally expect to see in a human body cell. So that's going to be a problem. So in order to alleviate that problem, sex cells have half the normal amount of chromosomes. So gametes are not diploid. Gametes are haploid because they are arranged into single pair or single 23 chromosomes. There are 23 chromosomes arranged in single configuration. Now we use some mathematical designations for this and you can see this on the slide over here but you can also see it on, um, on, the, on the board here. 2n equals 46. Anytime I see, I see 2n in, uh, in, in biology, 2n refers to diploid. Uh, that's what 2n is. And again, this is a mathematical equation. If you're solving for n, n would equal 23. 2 times 23 equals 46. Well, there's two, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 23 times 2 is going to give you 46. On the other hand, a haploid cell is going to be written down as n equals something. In the case of a human, it's going to be n equals 23 because we have 23 chromosomes arranged individually in the gametes of human sex cells. Now, Chromosome numbers vary in the animal and the plant and the and the uh, in all sorts of kingdoms around the, uh, the, the the biological realm of organisms. For example, ants they have a diploid number of two n equals two. Uh, gorillas two n equals uh, forty eight. Uh, shrimp have two n equals two hundred and forty. Uh, sorry, two hundred and fifty four. There's all sorts of crazy uh, numbers out there, and and the number of chromosomes doesn't really necessarily indicate. A complexity in the organism. That's not really um, something that you, you don't assume, hey, I've got more chromosomes, so I got to be a smarter or a more advanced organism. It may just be that that organism has been around or that group of organisms has been around a lot longer than other organisms. And through maybe mistakes in, in cell division, some of the chromosomes have actually split and divided into separate chromosomes and they have higher chromosomal numbers isn't always the case, but I mean, like, for example, ants have been around forever, yet there's a species of ant that really only has two chromosomes, so that's kind of an odd configuration, and when you see the shrimp beside it that are very, you know, they're, they're somewhat closely related, they're both arthropods, and they've got 254 chromosomes, but there is some debate as to why some organisms have more chromosomes uh, than others. And finally, um, there, is, uh, there are some organisms that don't play by that diploid-haploid rule. There are some organisms out there, and these are mainly organisms in the plant kingdom, that can have numbers like 4n, uh, 6n, 8n. So these organisms are, don't have chromosomes arranged into pairs. They have chromosomes arranged into fours, or chromosomes arranged into sixes, or chromosomes arranged into eights. Um, now the question is, if I had, let's say, um, an organism that's 6n, 
what would its gamete look like? What would the configuration of the gamete be? And you can take a look right up here in the corner. There's a little question to see if you can answer it. And I'm just going to give you a couple seconds to answer it. And I'm going to give you the answer. But if you had a 6N organism, what would the configuration be of its genetic material in the gamete? Well, in a human, we have body cells that are 2N, and the, the, the gamete has half the amount of genetic material, so they are N. So if I had an organism that is 6N in its body cells, the correct answer for the gametes would be 3N. It's, we're, we're just dividing the genetic material in half. We're going from 6N down to 3N. If I had an 8N organism in its body cells, then its gamete's going to be 4N. If I had a 4N organism, that 4N is going is to reduce down to 2N, in the gametes of those organisms, so uh, it's it's there's a there's a there's a, a fairly decent, I guess, pattern to that. Um, quick video for you, just in case you're interested here. There's a SciShow video coming up right here. It's right up there. Uh, you can see why you know why do plants have more chromosomes than us? And they'll discuss sort of how some of these plants have got just crazy numbers of chromosomes, and and why that is perhaps occurring. Uh, that's pretty much the end of uh, of genetic material. Uh, for your homework, here's what you can do. You're going to complete the cell division genetic material question booklet associated on the notes that you've seen here in the video and online on my website. Uh, thanks a lot, guys, and we'll see you next time.